Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Martin, and I'm here this morning uh, uh, at an invitation from the Lexington Computer Tech Group, uh, which I very much appreciate. It's always fun to talk about uh, Apollo, uh, which, as Michael Perlman said, I discussed with him, was uh, accomplished in a warehouse in New York City along 10th Avenue. At least that's a rumor. Um, uh, I'm uh, principally going to talk about, uh, uh, head toward the, the subject of uh, guidance and navigation, but um, the uh, presentation uh, outline here, in general, I would say I'm going to go through a bit of moon musings, you might say, uh, history and so on, a little bit of physics, if anybody can stand that. And I apologize if everybody understands that physics, it's not complicated at all. Uh, uh, but this uh, sort of talk is designed around a, a general audience, not, not a, uh, a, uh, a audience full of engineers. Uh, what happened politically with JFK and the Apollo pro program, the, gui the uh, Apollo guidance and navigation itself, the guidance and the computer, flights to the moon and return, a certain number of uh, uh, personal experiences that I, I will inject here and there and, and viewpoints that have, having lived through it. Okay, let's uh, uh, have an overview of what we're talking about here. I'm sure many people are, are familiar with the Apollo uh, mission, but uh, here is a kind of a schematic uh, which has a number of features to it. Uh, the big blue uh, Marvel in the left-hand uh, corner is, of course, the Earth. Uh, the moon uh, uh, rotates uh, uh, in a trajectory around the Earth, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And at the time of, uh, of uh, launch, uh, which first went into circular orbit around the Earth, and then uh, performed an a, uh, engine burn called translunar injection, TLI, which sent it on a, on a uh, on a uh, trajectory toward the moon. At the point of injection, the moon was in the lower right-hand corner. And of course, the moon is moving around the Earth in 28 days, approximately. So it moves along uh, as, as the mission continued, which was about two and a half days to, to reach the moon. So it's going to be in a different position. And the trajectory had to be designed so that it would meet the moon when, when uh, 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 to, in order to meet the moon in its dynamic uh, uh, path around the Earth. Uh, the, uh, uh, the trajectory can be characterized as an ellipse. Uh, it was a free return trajectory in the sense that if you uh, didn't uh, alter it by burning your engines, you could possibly go around the moon and come back to the Earth uh, for uh, safety purposes. Uh, not every trajectory need be that way. And as a matter of fact, if they are, they're somewhat restricted on where you can land in the moon. But nevertheless, uh, it, the Apollo 11 mission was designed as a, as a, 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 a free, free return mission. Then once you reach the moon, it went into lunar orbit insertion, LOI. And after a while, the lander went down and there was a surface stay on the moon in the center of the screen. And after about 21 hours, uh, there was a lunar ascent uh, from, from the uh, surface of the, uh, of, of the moon uh, to a rendezvous with the command module, which was in circular orbit around the, around the moon. Then there was a firing of, uh, of the engine again, which uh, caused a, uh, um, a trans-Earth injection, in a sense. On a, and uh, uh, headed toward, uh, headed back home, and uh, finally uh, uh, re-entry into the atmosphere. Along the way, there was provision for various mid-course corrections, and we'll talk about that in, in, in a little while. But this is the overall scheme. Uh, this wasn't the only way to do this mission. Uh, there were a number of candidates, but uh, a very clever uh, engineer at NASA came up with the idea that uh, fuel would be minimized by creating a small landing craft and not have to carry down a huge 
uh, uh, vehicle to the lunar surface and then take off again, but a, a, uh, a uh, capsule in orbit around the moon, sending down a small landing craft would minimize the amount of fuel uh, being used for the uh, mission. Fuel, of course, is a, a major consideration, uh, having to crawl out of a gravity hole of the earth uh, carrying all that fuel, you, you, you really have payload that is a, a fraction of the total uh, weight of a vehicle uh, uh, sitting on the pad of about six, over six million pounds and uh, winding up uh, uh, at the lunar surface uh, with a small vehicle like the, uh, like the lunar excursion module. Um, of course, uh, I, I characterize it as the great adventure of the 20th century. And of course, 20th century had a lot of adventures, but uh, 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 I prefer to term, term it as the greatest. Here's the blue marble. It's an iconic photo looking back at the earth from Apollo 17 in, in about 1972. And this is uh, perhaps the most uh, 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 printed photo in the entire world, uh, it was a magnificent uh, picture and you can see continents and oceans and clouds and this and that. And uh, it has a, uh, both psychological and philosophic uh, aspects to it uh, about uh, living on uh, all people on, on one planet and how lonely this blue marble is in the, in the expanse of the universe. I think the black border is very characteristic of what one would see as a as a the blackness of space, except for the distant stars. And of course, the other photo that's most interesting is Earthrise. This was taken by a crew member of the Apollo 8 mission, and as he was in orbit around the moon, and then all of a sudden, up popped the the uh, Earth in uh, in in what is termed Earthrise, and you can see that the Earth is uh, uh, partly in shadow, of course, because the uh, where, where the sunshine, the black the blackness or the boundary between the lit side of the Earth and the unlit side, of, unlit portion of the Earth is called a terminator, and it's uh, the same thing on the Moon. There would be a terminator, uh, one side in sunlight and one side in darkness. Okay. Uh, how did, uh, where did this moon come from anyway? And that we look up and see, and uh, there were uh, uh, a number of theories of where the moon came from and how it was formed. And uh, uh, one of them was that the earth was spinning so fast uh, that it threw off the moon. And, uh, and uh, this was uh, not consistent with the earth's momentum. And uh, the earth would have had to have been spinning on a two hour day and uh, that, that sort of theory is, has been rejected. Or well, the moon was formed at the same time as the earth uh, uh, after the uh, formation of the universe, but the uh, structure of the moon and the earth are, uh, the, the interior, the metallic structure is different. That was rejected. And perhaps it was formed somewhere else and captured by the earth as it uh, traveled toward the earth. And uh, it, it would have had to lose too much energy to be captured by the Earth. So and that, that was not uh, a uh, viable theory either. So what is it? This is a, uh, just a schematic of to, to understand what the sizes that we're talking about. We have the Earth in the upper right uh, left-hand corner. The moon size is about the, the small circle, the difference of the diameters. And you can think of it about the size of laying over the United States. I mean, that's about the uh, 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 size that we're talking about when we think about the moon. Okay, uh, looking back into history, there's been desire to reach the moon and to think about the moon down through the ages. And uh, if, we, if we go to the ancients, uh, of course, they looked at the moon just like uh, we do today, but it was a total and complete mystery and turned into a, a worship, a, a religious worship of many, many cultures. 
uh, 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 sometimes it's a male uh, moon, sometimes it's a female moon, sometimes there's threat of uh, impregnation of women at night in a full moon, uh, and there's the use of the moon for calendars, uh, for measuring, there's the uh, uh, dread of monsters and, uh, and, uh, and other, other such uh, superstitions. But the, uh, in, in ancient times, the moon was something that was uh, ever present uh, uh, to pe people and a desire to understand and to reach out to it, not knowing where it was or how far it was or how high it was or, or anything really about it. And then moving along, you might think of the pre-Isaac Newton era where the moon was a uh, subject of fantasy, uh, mostly uh, social satire that is uh, projecting uh, 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 civilization on earth and uh, politics and uh, customs and what have you, projecting it onto the moon uh, and to how to get there. And there were many, many stories that are written by uh, Cyrano de Bergerac and others about how to get to the moon on swan's wings, uh, using magnets that you throw up in the air and a magnet would then catch you and you throw it again and so on. Rising on vials of dew that have been evaporated by the heat of the sun, uh, using vacuums in one fashion, even using rockets which was an interesting uh, 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 discovery or speculation. And then of course, so where did gravity end? And uh, you look up into the sky and you see all those clouds and then uh, how far does the atmosphere go up? And why not, why, why couldn't you uh, just get above, above the clouds and above, uh, above gravity and just keep on going to the moon? I mean, there was no, uh, 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 solid theory about what is holding it there. And so there were many, many stories and you can look up in, uh, in, on the web or in libraries about uh, early speculation about the, the, the moon. And I've classified all those as, as fantasy, but many of them were sophisticated social satire of the times of the day. And these are, uh, uh, the year 1600, 1650, 1500, and so on. The, the, uh, I would call that uh, uh, pre-Isaac Newton fantasy. And then of course, we have uh, Sir Isaac Newton arrived plus Galileo and plus Kepler. And uh, now we have uh, a scientific basis to understand what, the, what is drawing the moon and where, how high does atmosphere go and why do we have pressure and, and, uh, and uh, how does gravity sort of work? Not, not understanding what gravity is, but uh, if you uh, use Newton's equations, uh, not only do they predict where everything goes and falls and so on, but the entire Apollo program can be used with Newtonian physics and nothing else. Uh, so I would call that it, it brought in a period in literature of what I would call science fiction. That is, it, uh, it, 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 many fictional stories, but not necessarily fantasy, uh, it, it sort of more based on, uh, based on physics and based on an understanding of science uh, with a fictional twist. And of course, one of the, or the most famous stories along these lines is written by Jules Verne uh, in, in about 1865, where he wrote the book, From Earth to, Mo From Earth to Moon. And uh, his method, was, uh, the, the hero of the story is a uh, Captain Barbicane who, uh, who runs a, uh, is a uh, convention like the Lexington Computer Group uh, but it's called the Baltimore Gun Society. And um, these uh, Civil War veterans all sat around with one arm and one leg and all lamented the fact that there's just not gonna be any more war. And what are they gonna do with all their art artillery know-how? And the captain uh, comes up with the idea of a brand new uh, project that excites everybody and we're gonna to go to the moon. 
And how are we going to do it? We're going to do it with a 900 foot cannon, at, which is buried in the ground. The cannon will be called Columbiad, and it will fire a projectile with three individuals that will head toward the moon. And, uh, and uh, this was a, a, a very popular book. You, you may, many of you re probably read it as uh, teenagers. And there was a sequel to it called Round the Moon, in which, he, uh, in, in which the capsule comes back to Earth. Many of the names used in the, uh, in the novel uh, found its way into the Apollo program or the space program in one way or another, even having, uh, never mind the names, but having three astronauts aboard and a splashdown in the Pacific. H.G. Uh, Wells came a little bit later with a story about anti-gravity material, and he could block gravity um, and, and have a vehicle fly to the moon by blocking the effect of gravity and then allowing gravity to come on and off in order to steer the vehicle. Uh, that was a, uh, uh, a, a bit of a fantasy. Uh, Jules Verne took it uh, as uh, being that H.G. Wells didn't understand science, but H.G. Wells said that Jules Verne didn't have a uh, sense of humor. Um, at any rate, uh, here we have uh, Jules Verne's uh, From Earth to Moon in 1865, a 900 foot cannon that is buried in the ground. And uh, we'll see a little uh, clip of a, a movie in a moment. And, uh, but where to launch this, uh, this vehicle? Well, they had a, a uh, contest between Texas and Florida and perhaps California. And uh, with all the political uh, chicanery that you can imagine and in the novel and Florida is chosen and uh, it is, uh, the launch site is built in Florida and it has to be between plus or minus 28 degrees, fa uh, degrees latitude. Uh, and uh, there's only a little spot in Texas like that, but uh, we have opportunities in Florida. And uh, why 28 degrees? Because the, you wanna fire a uh, projectile that would be in the lunar plane that goes around the earth. And the, uh, that varies in, uh, in, in angle to the equator. And so you choose a launch window that would, that would uh, save fuel and you wouldn't have to change the plane of your orbit. Anyway, uh, by the way, uh, Vern describes this in great detail, describes the cannon, describes how it's built, describes the charge, describes the capsule, the weights, the measurements and everything else, all in, 18, in 1865. Okay, uh, this uh, was a movie that was shown in 1902. All right, we all understand uh, Newton's first laws. Uh, uh, you have a, a, a resistance to change in the absence of a force, an object at rest it continues at rest and an object in motion continues the same motion. So here's, if you have a stone, a, a curling stone and you have ice, no friction, let's say, you just throw it, it's gonna go in a straight line and it's gonna keep going once you let go of your, the force. Everybody understands that and has a feeling for it now once Newton understood and told us all about it. Uh, we all understand what mass and weight is, uh, weight is and of course mass is stuff and it exists out there uh, as a material. Uh, weight has to have a, a gravity associated with it. So in space there's no weight on the moon, there's one kind of weight, and on the uh, Earth, there's another kind of weight, uh, depending upon the, the uh, strength of gravity. Now, let me spend a moment here for a minute, uh, 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 a moment for a minute. Uh, in Newtonian motion, we understand ideally that in linear motion, if you apply a force to a mass, it will go out in a straight line in space. Uh, and it, it is, uh, when once you apply the force, uh, you will create an acceleration, you remove the force, you have a certain velocity and it will continue in a straight line uh, uh, as a, uh, a, a velocity, you can think of it as a vector with a, a, a quantity and a direction. 
Uh, analogously, there's an uh, angular Newtonian motion, which we can imagine being a gyroscope similar to the kind of thing that you did as a child or as a kid, you had your gyroscope. And there's a, an analogous expression of torque equal in her, uh, I alpha instead of F equal MA. And uh, this has to do with the rotation. And with a zero torque, the rotational axis will point in a specific direction and will not change that direction in space. So you, as you might remember as a kid, you spun up the gyroscope and it pointed somewhere and then you could move your hand and the gyroscope would move because it would, it would still point in the same direction. Now this is an important concept for, for, uh, for Apollo or for any space vehicle because we want kind of some kind of a platform or a, a frame of reference that will be fixed in space. So if we can create a, a way of holding our, our orientation in space, we can create a reference point that we can then use for the purpose of computation. And so these gyros, these gyroscopes uh, will, will give us that and we'll see that in a moment. Uh, Newton, using Newton's laws and, and, and and uh, a little sled here with no friction. Uh, the sled is on ice, uh, has a little stack of bricks on it. And a, a, a young fellow there who picks up a brick and throws it off to his uh, right there. And he has some positive momentum of the mass times the velocity of that brick. And uh, we can all guess how that, how that uh, sled will move. And uh, of course, it will move to the left uh, when he throws, to the, throws the brick to the right. And that will be a conservation of momentum. So uh, that's uh, one of Newton's laws. So we have a little fellow there who picks up a brick, throws it to the right, the sled moves to the left. So what's interesting? Well, we'll stack them up with a lot of bricks and he'll start throwing them and he can throw them pretty fast and he throws each brick and it goes and every time he throws another brick, he, he adds a little velocity to the, to the left and, and after a while he sums up all this velocity and, uh, and this sled really begins to move. And uh, this is a very analogous to the way that a rocket would, would, uh, would work. You, uh, it's analogous to the mass flow out the back end of a rocket. The speed of the brick is like the exhaust velocity of the material coming out the back end of the rocket. And so you, you throw the material out and the rocket moves to the, uh, uh, in the opposite direction. And depending upon the kind of fuel you use, the efficiency of the rocket and so on, you get the thrust that you're interested in. And for example, on the pad at, uh, at uh, uh, Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy, uh, you had a uh, six, and, six and some odd million ton, uh, pound rocket and you had a seven and a half million pound thrust that was created by throwing mass out the back end that would lift the rocket up. So we take, take our vehicle and we get it into circular orbit. And then uh, using Kepler's laws and Newton's equations and so on that were most of us are familiar with, but some may not be. You, let's say you finally get your rocket into a circular orbit around the earth. And uh, now what do you, you, now what you wanna do is uh, send it out from the earth. So you have to create a change in velocity, which will change the trajectory of the vehicle. And depending upon how much energy you, you add to that vehicle, you will get different kinds of uh, trajectories. 
And the uh, energy, of course, translates to a, a change in velocity. And we'll call that delta V, which is extremely important concept because this is the way you, you change your trajectory no matter where in space by adding some kind of delta V to what your current velocity is. And so here in this little diagram, if you, end, if you added some velocity, you'd get an ellipse. If you added a little bit more, you'd get a parabola. If you added a little bit more, you'd get a hyperbola. And notice the ellipse will return, of course, to the, to the point where you, uh, you fired, perhaps, and the parabola won't return, and the hyperbola certainly won't return. So uh, using these laws, how do you do this? Well, taking Newton's F equal ma and just manipulating it, understanding that acceleration is the change of velocity over time. You do some athletic, athletic <laughs> algebraic, manipulations and you get that equation delta V is equal to F times delta T over mass. Let's presume for the sake of this argument that mass is constant because it's a, it becomes a mathematical complication which we don't have to get into at, in this talk. But to, get, to, to achieve the delta V, what you wanna do is get an F, which is the force of the rocket over a period of time. And if you fire the rocket for five minutes, one minute, one second, you create a certain amount of thrust and you create this delta, delta V. So another concept that, that I, I think is significant is we all understand that what goes up must come down. So here we have a little rocket that we're gonna throw fire. We're gonna burn it out. And when, it, when it's finished burning, it uh, gravity just pulls it back to earth. Okay, and so it's, it's gonna fall. Gravity is always working on it, even when you're firing the engine, but you now would have two forces, one firing the engine up and one dragging the, end, the vehicle down. But when the engine quits firing, you just fall. So you'd, you'd be falling. So the object after its launch is always falling. It's always falling. Now, uh, I, I really wanted to get into another uh, 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 slide, but let's, let's keep going the way, the way we're going right now. Uh, in 1960, uh, uh, if you, you all recall <laughs> that uh, Kennedy's 1960 uh, election campaign uh, the uh, nation was losing this race to the Soviet Union uh, because of complacent, complacency, miscalculations, penny pinching, budget drawbacks, cutbacks, incredibly confused management, and so on and so on. And uh, as president, he announced a bold new program. Now I have a tape, which I can't, I'm not gonna show, but uh, I will just describe it to you. You may remember it. He appears at the Rice University in uh, Texas on a, a incredibly hot day. And he gets up and he gives an inspiring speech on how we're going to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard and that we're going to lead, uh, lead the way. And, uh, and, and if we don't do it, somebody else is gonna do it, but the United States is gonna do it. And he gets a tremendous applause and sitting behind him is, uh, is uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson with his handkerchief constantly sweating his, uh, uh, his brow. It was very inspiring uh, speech. Uh, now there's a, there was a meeting at the White House, which I, I, I don't show as a, uh, as a clip here, a uh, meeting at the White House in which uh, he met, uh, uh, JFK met with James Webb, the uh, NASA administrator, jo jo Jerome Wiesner, the MIT scientist who is now his science advisor, and Robert Siemens, a NASA executive, very smart guy. 
and they uh, sat around and, uh, and talked about going to the moon. And James Webb was actually, it's a very interesting transcript. That debate, uh, Webb is actually arguing with the president about how we have to do this. And uh, JFK, in frustration partly, but still rather controlled, tries to explain to these scientists, although Webb was a manager, not a scientist, that this is important for political reasons. This is whether we like it or not, in a sense, a race. If we get second up to the moon, it's nice, but it's like being second anytime. And if we're second by six months, that would be very serious. And uh, Webb is trying to argue the fact that there's a lot of things that we have to do before we get to the moon. We have to understand what the surface is like. We have to understand it's a hostile environment. We have to understand the temperature. We don't know about the equipment and so on and so on. And, and uh, there's the, uh, the weather at the launch and, and all these things. And uh, Kennedy says, yes, 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 yes. I understand all that, it's very important. But the most important thing is this is, this is important for political reasons. And then he follows and he says that this program is the top priority. It certainly is mine. And we ought to be clear because otherwise we shouldn't be spending this kind of money because I am not that interested <laughs> in space. And so it was very clear from this meeting where JFK was coming from with respect to what this Apollo program was all about. It's a race to beat the Russians, regardless of the scientific content. Uh, although uh, he, he, did, he didn't say that there was no scientific content, but he was there for, for this purpose. Right. Now, getting into the vehicles and the equipment itself, this is a, as you can see, a 361 foot rocket you get to the very top of the rocket. Let's go, let's go backwards. Let's start at the top. Uh, there's a uh, escape uh, uh, vehicle there that will pull the command module, which is called the Apollo spacecraft right there, away from the vehicle in case there's a problem. Uh, and and take, the, take the astronauts off and they'd land by parachute, hopefully, safely. safely. I don't, that was never, never had to be used. Underneath the escape vehicle there is the Apollo spacecraft consisting of two pieces, the command module and the service module. We'll see more of that. Then there's a, uh, a housing underneath that, which is uh, the, uh, where the LEM is stored, uh, the lunar excursion module, sometimes called LM, but in some uh, documentation is LEM. Then there's an instrument unit, which is really the instrumentation for the Saturn vehicle, which was built and programmed by IBM for the purpose of launch from the space, from, from uh, uh, the Cape. Once the vehicle was launched, that was the end of the uh, IBM uh, control and the end of the instrument, uh, instrument unit. Uh, underneath that is the S4B booster, which will uh, be part of the uh, boost to orbit, but then the vehicle that sends the uh, booster that sends the vehicle to the moon. Then there's the S2 booster, which is a intermediate boost uh, in, uh, on trajectory toward, uh, 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 toward uh, uh, orbit. And then there's the main S1 booster with its uh, five engines uh, creating seven and a half million pounds of thrust, uh, 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 which is the final down at the bottom. And there's the size of the human being down at the bottom of the vehicle, just to give you some scale about what the Saturn vehicle was. It was the biggest vehicle built ever that, that flew. Uh, NASA's got some plans that would make it, that, uh, that would uh, be bigger for deep space. But nevertheless, uh, this was a, uh, a monster on the, on the pad. Uh, this is a, a, a photo uh, in Florida, or, or schematic rather, in Florida. And uh, what you see uh, on the left-hand side is the space shuttle, not the, uh, not the Apollo, so, but, you know, but it worked the same way. We're looking at the vertical assembly building off in the distance. 
the uh, vehicle assembly building, pardon me, uh, VAV, it was a huge building, 30 or 35 stories high, very big. And, uh, inside, it was uh, almost all hollow. There was no, uh, uh, no rooms or anything, maybe at the periphery. And uh, I, I, I did take a, a tour through there, as a, not as a tourist, but on an assignment. And uh, we went up in an elevator, and uh, there was no vehicle in there in, in, the, uh, in the building at that time. But there were little uh, 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 floors that you could get off uh, on the elevator and, and caged walkways that would take you out to a vehicle that was being assembled. And so we got off at the I don't know, 20th floor or the 22nd floor or whatever it was. And you could walk from the elevator out on a caged platform that went out maybe 50 feet toward the toward a vehicle that wasn't there at that time. And uh, the caged what I mean by a caged platform is that the sides were all made of metal caging, but so was the floor. And so you could look down right through the caging, right down to the bottom of the vehicle assembly building. And uh, there were people on the elevator, there were five of us or six of us or so on. There were people who could not walk out on that floor. Uh, their legs would shake. They couldn't step on the floor because they could see down through it. And uh, it was just plain scary. And if you took the vehicle, if you took the elevator all the way to the top and got to the roof and got off and just walked around the roof, it was beautiful. It was just like any other roof, but you could see for miles on flat Florida. But when you were when you're inside the building, it was frightening. Okay, here's the uh, uh, the command and service module vehicle. I just want to point out a few things on the vehicle itself. Uh, in the back is the service propulsion system. That's the main engine that uh, that you fire to uh, to come uh, come home. Uh, and to make uh, orbital changes around the moon. Uh, there's the service module itself, which holds a lot of fuel and other equipments. There are reaction control systems, RC, RC control jets you can see over in, the, over in the corner over here. There's one that's shown that allows you to orient the vehicle uh, up and down, uh, pitch roll, yaw, and, uh, uh, then in the front, there's the command module, which also has reaction control uh, jets on it. And then you have a docking probe over here on the right-hand side that it's gonna clip onto the, uh, onto, the lunar surf, uh, onto the lunar vehicle. This consisted of the, the, the CSM, or the command and service module. This, of course, was the LEM. Uh, built by Grumman Aerospace uh, in Grumman uh, in uh, Bethpage, Long Island. This uh, vehicle uh, was, uh, it, it, it looked very, very flimsy, put it that way. Uh, I worked most of the, uh, my program was on the CSM side, so I didn't have too much to do with the lemon until later in the, uh, in the program. But uh, on, the, on the CSM side, we always used to joke, at least, that this thing would never, this limb would never fly. It, it, it really looked like a Rube Goldberg kind of, uh, kind of device. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and as I said, uh, uh, very flimsy. Of course, I'd have to deal with lunar gravity, not Earth gravity. And the, uh, the landing pods uh, and the landing system could support a drop down of so many feet if you if uh, it didn't if it didn't land softly, uh, and it had communication gear on top, windows for the astronauts and and so on. Now on board the Apollo, there were lots of systems, uh, guidance navigation, which had a computer, of course, uh, optics for the uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, astronaut to uh, look at stars and uh, make uh, a, a, and other uh, points of observation. An inertial measurement unit, an IMU, uh, uh, 
based on inertia uh, uh, that you would use for, use for inertial guidance. Um, uh, I hope to be able to get to that shortly. Um, of course, the electrical power system, fuel cells, a life support system, communications, uh, the propulsion, the engines, a thermal system, oxygen, a waste system, spacesuits, and so on. Every one of these things was a system, let's say, that the astronauts had to know, they had to learn about, they had to, they had to be students on, they had to visit the contractors, sit in classrooms, read manuals and so on. We had them at MIT quite a number of times sitting in classrooms, learning about the computer, learning about the guidance and navigation system. I believe this is true around the country. There were 400,000 people who worked on Apollo in, in many, many uh, contract, uh, uh, contractors, uh, companies, and each one producing some portion of the Apollo uh, program, which had to be understood to some level by the astronauts. So they, 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 they really had to uh, uh, do a tremendous amount of study and a tremendous amount of absorption. Of course, they had communications to the ground to help them and other people on duty all the time, but nevertheless, the, the, it was quite a learning load. This is a schematic of, uh, of, of the uh, getting closer to the, the, the navigation and control system, let's say. Uh, this had a few pieces and parts. In the center, it was a computer, one cubic foot, I would say, the Apollo computer. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, uh, to the right, you see the astronaut, uh, and he uh, has a, con a hand controller that he has. He also has a keyboard that's shown at the bottom of the screen, a computer display and keyboard called a disky, and we have a picture of that, a better picture of that that he can put in in, in data. There's an inertial platform over to the left that that uh, uh, detects a motion and puts in, uh, can put in signals into the computer. And of course the computer can issue uh, commands that, uh, that affect the vehicle control, both in thrust, uh, both uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the control system and the uh, navigation system itself, and to fire uh, attitude jet commands for for uh, uh, changing the orientation of the, uh, of the vehicle. Uh, this system was uh, generally the same in both the command module and the LEM. Of course, the picture on the right would be the command module, not the LEM, but the system was the same, same computer, uh, same inertial system, same keyboard and so on. Of course, uh, a different suite of programs, a man and service module was not going to land on the moon and the LEM was not going to uh, enter the earth atmosphere. So the, sir, the computer programs were different, but the hardware was principally the same. Now, going back to that inertial platform that I mentioned before, you can think of it as a platform, a real platform, let's say a piece of uh, metal or a, uh, something. And we're gonna put things on this platform and we're gonna put gyros on this platform like that. So we have three gyros, which are similar to gyroscopes and they're going to have their axis pointing in certain directions. And they're going to perform, they're going to uh, establish a reference system in quote inertial space. That is each one of those red uh, vectors points towards something which is fixed. Let's say two stars and, a, uh, and then a, uh, uh, another axis perpendicular to those two axes. And once you set those gyros up, initialize them and get them going, in theory, they would hold this platform through a, a series of uh, uh, servo mechanisms to that would hold this, this platform in fixed space. And you would know in the computer what that fixed space is. 
And then onto the platform, you'd put some accelerometers like that. And the accelerometers would measure forces that you would uh, use uh, if you turned on the engine. And those forces would be collected by the computer and the orientation of those accelerometers would be understood with respect to the platform. And therefore you would know uh, which or, or what directions everything was in and whatever computations you made in the, in the, uh, the computer, you could then uh, compute uh, predictions or directions or, or, or to point or look at optics, look at stars, whatever. And if you had to do things in a different reference system, you would then have the mathematics to, to, uh, to change uh, uh, orientation from one reference system to another. But your, the basics would be in a inertial reference system that, that would be established by these gyros. Now the accelerometer principle was relatively simple. You could think of it as a mass and a spring on the left-hand side over here with a zero point. If you begin to move the platform, if you accelerate it to the, to the left here, the mass would move to the right. You'd get a distance here, you'd pick off that distance and you'd understand what the force was on, on, the, uh, uh, on this accelerometer. And using mathematics, you could then, uh, and knowing masses, you could then convert that to eventually convert that to a, uh, a, uh, a force over time and you would get a delta V. So here, for example, is what I just said. You, you'd, uh, uh, you'd have an acceleration over a small period of time, therefore you'd know uh, uh, what this delta V was and then you'd, you'd add up these delta Vs and you'd have a total velocity would be the sum of these rectangles. And you'd know if you, if you wanted to, get, to gain, let's say uh, 25 feet per second in a certain direction, you would orient the vehicle using the inertial platform. You would point it in the right direction. You would use the computer to fire the engines. It would start it and cut it off in 25 seconds. You would then have collected the amount of Delta V, uh, you, uh, the forces, you would know exactly what the Delta V is, then you would have changed your trajectory. So how is this applied? Well, here we have the earth and you're in circular orbit, this dotted, this dotted uh, uh, circle. And you got to the point where you're going to do TLI, that is translunar injection. And over here in this little insert over here, you had V0, which is the velocity that you had in the circle. That's the velocity that you currently have. But in order to get to the moon, you need Vm. You had to get, you had to change, you had to change your velocity from this, from here to there in order to get on this ellipse. And this ellipse, by the way, would take you up. Uh, uh, up uh, from the, the moon's position, which was T0, at T0, the time you, t you fired the engine, it, it, the moon would be at T1 by the time you got your ellipse all the way out and you came all the way into the moon's sphere, uh, gravitational sphere. And then you'd have a different problem then, which we are I, I, not elaborating on that. That's a matter of trajectories, but. Uh, but the idea here is that to get on, to initially get on, and this was a free return, you'd come up over here toward the moon, you'd go around the moon if you didn't do anything, and then you'd come back toward Earth that way. So what, what, what did you need to do? Well, you had to point the engines in a certain direction in order to gain this much delta V in red. When you had that, your velocity, you had this delta V, you got Vm, you shut the engine off, and then you coasted the rest of the way and you let uh, Newton take you uh, the rest of the way toward the moon. Now, we saw that, which I showed you this before, uh, nothing is perfect. Uh, your gyros might uh, drift a little bit, changing the orientation of your platform that you thought was fixed in space. Therefore, you've made some errors. Your delta V is not exactly in the direction it was supposed to be. 
so your trajectory is not exactly the way you wanted it. So you provided for a certain mid-course corrections. And in order to get those mid-course corrections, there are two methods. Either they're, they're radioed up from the ground because they have figured out what, they, what you need, or if you are in an autonomous mode, which uh, uh, we haven't talked about that at all, uh, originally the plans that Dr. Draper had at the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory was to create an autonomous uh, uh, flight to the moon. Uh, uh, later on, it was decided that the computers did not have enough capability and therefore the ground became the primary and the uh, uh, computers became the backup. Uh, the onboard system became the backup, but the onboard system was capable of doing star sightings through the optics and correcting the, uh, the, the uh, uh, inertial platform and pointing the things in the correct direction and so on. And the astronauts were all trained for that. But the point here is that along the way, these red delta Vs that I show here, little delta Vs are mid course corrections. And if you needed a mid-course correction, it might only be a few feet per second. You might only have to fire the engine for a quarter of a second or a second and a half or something like that. And you would then slightly alter your, your, uh, your trajectory and you'd head back toward the moon. Uh, this is a, a picture of the, of the disky, the manner in which the uh, uh, astronaut entered data into the uh, into the computer. Now I, I had a, uh, a a YouTube on this uh, interactive YouTube, and I I can't use it, so I'll just explain to you that uh, the display was what is shown here, and this might be hours, minutes, and seconds. It could be feet, or, or could be centimeters. It, it could be uh, uh, temperature, it could be lots of things that would be created by the display um, software inside the computer. If you, uh, brought, if you use these verbs and nouns, a verb was generally an action of some sort and a, and a noun was what the, what, what, what the information or what action you were doing. In this case, it was display time. Verb 16 was a display verb and, and and 36 was mission time. So what would come six hours, 58 minutes, 33.86 seconds if you displayed uh, this as shown over here. Uh, you could also uh, select programs, uh, programs for uh, re-entry, programs for, for landing, programs for rendezvous and so on. And then the astronaut would see the, uh, the data necessary or, or enter the data necessary or, or select programs or do che self checks or other such things using this disky and, and uh, right with his gloves or keyboard right on top of these little numbers over, uh, uh, over here. It was very effective and a very interesting way of dealing with communications. Of course, there was no mouse, no, you didn't have a mouse, you didn't have a physical, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a visual aspect of this. It was all done in numbers and was very effective. Uh, I, I don't expect you to read any of this, but here is a, a list of the, of the various programs that be, can be selected. For example, down over here is, P, is uh, program 40. That's hit the, uh, that's a burn the service propulsion system. Here's 41, burn the, uh, uh, reaction control and so on, backups and maneuvers and, and times and, and this and that, a lot of uh, uh, programs. And here on the left-hand side, side are all the verb codes and here on the right-hand side are all the noun codes and what, the, what their displays are coming up uh, on the, that, uh, that three-level displays. So you can see the astronaut had his work cut out for him. He had these pasted up in the, in the, in the cockpit. He had worked with these things before, and this was his method of communicating with the computer. Um, this just gives you a little bit of, uh, of comparison of the AGC uh, 1965 
and what your smartphone might have been in 2014. Uh, uh, so in memory size, the uh, smartphone might have had a factor of 500,000 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in memory, uh, 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 a million times more of what might be called volatile or, uh, uh, I forgot the word, we called it erasable at that time. Uh, this is a memory that you can read, write, uh, 650 times in the uh, basic machine cycle. Uh, the size of it uh, uh, between your phone, your cell phone and the computer, for example, was uh, that kind of factor, 665 and, and so on and so on. So what you had was a relatively slow, primitive computer compared to what we have today. And it's absolutely remarkable about the stuff that we did in that computer. I just wanted to cover this for a moment in this time perspective here of uh, let's say two seconds, looking at that, breaking down the seconds into maybe 40 millisecond slices that we see on the right hand side within the computer. This is a very complicated diagram and I don't intend to dwell on it very much, but these show every 40 milliseconds or so the various programs that are running in the computer over a period of time and then recycled again from here to here. For example, looking at it closer, here you'll see it says uh, RCS autopilot up over here. Here's a keyboard uh, uh, calculating uh, some kind of attitude, uh, attitude maneuvers and so on. Uh, uh, what I want to emphasize here, this is about 0.8 seconds in the computer. So you had these various things happening and various programmings com com coming on and off in 0.8 seconds. High priority autopilot, medium priority engine burn, low priority display, attitude change. In this short time interval, all these jobs would seem simultaneous to the human being, just like it is today when you're, when you're getting a lot of programs going on at the same time and the computer is doing them in a sense in this computer, one at a time with a single CPU. Now, one of very, very significant things in Apollo is that we had a priority driven executive that was created by a genius by the name of Hal Lanning in which only the highest priority job would run. So if a low priority job happened to be running at the time that a high priority job was, uh, was, was scheduled to run, the high priority job would take over the computer, save everything from the low priority job, complete the high priority job, and then go back to the low priority job. So, and each job was given a priority number, one, two, three, 40, whatever it is, 30, and so on whatever jobs you had had a priority number so that you were always assured that the highest priority job would get done no matter what. Okay, here we get the, uh, the, the LEM now connected to the, to the uh, 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 CSM through this uh, docking tunnel and, uh, and a docking connector. So I, I did explain to you what this, the, this engine is on the CSM. Here, uh, there are two engines here. One is the descent engine that takes the vehicle down to the lunar surface. And the other buried inside is the ascent engine. So this entire descent uh, structure will sit on the ground of the, um, of, uh, sit on the, the lunar surface and act as the platform for the ascent engine, which is for the ascent vehicle, which is just this section of the of the uh, the limb, and it has its engine right over here. This is the ladder coming that goes down toward the lunar lunar surface. And so here is a, a schematic of coming down from the uh, from the orbit, headed down uh, in a in various sections of the braking phase, the approach or visibility phase, the terminal landing phase. Each of these sections of, of, of the way down had phases 
and and for for a while the astronaut could not even see the uh, the the ground until it tipped up enough for him to see where he was landing. Now, unfortunately, I can't show these uh, these uh, these uh, clips, and maybe at another time you can schedule uh, the, uh, these, and I I, I will show them. Uh, uh, there's a uh, the the uh, bottom one over here is a very significant clip that shows the actual lunar landing, and it it it, it talks it down. It's about three and minutes and 15 seconds long. And it shows it out the window and it shows the astronaut getting closer and closer and closer to the, 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 the lunar surface uh, while he's talking and reading out the, uh, the vertical and horizontal speeds and the altitude from the lunar surface. And in the picture, the lunar surface is getting larger and larger and larger with the craters becoming more and more distinct. And on the way down, he starts all of a sudden starting to call out alarms. And there were alarms coming out of the computer, a 1201 and a 1202 alarm. And uh, I was in this, uh, this room at MIT listening to this. And when these alarms came up, everybody was absolutely shocked at the alarms. And nobody understood what these computer alarms were. And uh, somebody at NASA had the, had the uh, the, the uh, forethought to write some of these alarms down. Uh, I had never seen one, and I was a manager at, uh, at uh, MIT, and I never had counted any of these alarms. And it indicated that jobs were being dropped off the job queue inside of the computer, and the computer was not getting to do everything that was, it was scheduled to do. And uh, this was on the way down. In the meantime, somebody is reading off 60 seconds and 30 seconds and so on. And uh, this was another, uh, somebody on the ground reading off the amount of fuel left in the vehicle before it had to abort. So there was a safety measure that's saying, if you got down to zero, you had to abort. There was enough fuel to get back to the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the orbiting spacecraft, but not enough fuel to land. And so you had one guy calling off the amount of fuel, the astronauts talking about their 1202 alarm, asking for somebody at NASA to, to follow up and find out what those are. The, uh, the people at, that at NASA uh, saying that we're on it, we're working on it. People calling up, up at MIT asking them, what the hell are those at, at, at 1201 and 1202 alarms? And then somebody at NASA telling them to go on with the mission, do not abort. Now the guy at NASA understood that the jobs were being dropped off and he thought that since the most pri highest priority jobs were being done, that this was not a fatal, fatal flaw. And so he, he called for the guy to continue and the astronaut continued onto the, onto the ground, landing safely with about less than 30 seconds of fuel left before he had to abort, but landing not knowing what these alarms were. And it took us a, a, a quite a number of hours. Uh, they was, he was on the ground for 21 hours. It took us quite a number of hours to understand what this was all about. And even today, it's somewhat controversial, but it had to do with uh, putting on a switch uh, for the rendezvous radar on the, uh, on the spacecraft, which is used for uh, when he is ascending toward the toward the, uh, the command module uh, for the radar that is going to rendezvous. And the mechanism of, of software and hardware within the, within the, uh, the uh, system uh, had this uh, uh, computer looking for data, constantly looking for data from the rendezvous radar system. And that constant looking for data was taking away cycle stealing, taking away time from the computer, reducing the amount of time that the computer had for effective work by about 20% or 15 to 20%. As a result, various low priority jobs were not getting done. And because they weren't getting done and dropping off the end of the job queue, it was issuing belongs 1201 and 1202, which, uh, which were not really affecting his landing 
but what are affecting his, certainly affecting his and everybody else's psyche of what was going on in those last few minutes before, before uh, landing. It was a very exciting and uh, sort of thrilling time. Uh, on the surface of the moon, uh, the, these, uh, this uh, detail shows a panorama of what a, an astronaut might see looking around on the surface of the moon. There's some sun shadows there that you can see, but uh, it, it has a 360 uh, uh, view as you move the camera. And what you see is a, uh, a gray, uh, extremely desolate uh, landscape, pockmarked with all kinds of rocks and craters and an absolute black sky. And as the, as the uh, camera pans around, you then see the, uh, the, the full uh, uh, landing vehicle, which is off about 50 feet or 60 feet from the camera. And it's quite uh, uh, stark and uh, somewhat impressive to, uh, uh, oops, I just lost, oh, okay, just a second now. It's, it's quite uh, stark and somewhat impressive uh, to think about yourself uh, being projected into, into something like that and, uh, and just uh, seeing what, my God, what have I done? And of course, if you were lucky enough to have the, moon, the, the, the Earth in view, you'd see this magnificent blue marble in the middle of this black space. This is a picture of the uh, uh, lunar, uh, lunar vehicle just before takeoff. And there's the uh, Earth in, uh, in up, in, it's a dull, uh, not a very strong picture. It's a, the Earth in, uh, up in the sky there. The upper part of this vehicle will, is going to take off uh, just like this. The, uh, the clip that I have here is, an actual, is the actual takeoff. It goes very, very quickly uh, with plenty of thrust and it goes, uh, the thrust engine is right here. The astronauts are now aboard. These are the RCS jets and he's headed toward the, uh, the rendezvous with the, uh, with the spacecraft. And that's shown in the clip. Uh, He's headed toward the Earth, coming in toward the Earth. He has a very narrow window to hit the atmosphere right about here at about 400,000 feet. The Earth, he's got about a two degree uh, between 5.2 and 7.2 degrees to hit the, uh, uh, the uh, command module is gonna come in by itself, just like it shows here. Gonna hit the atmosphere this is, it looks like a rock, but it does have lift and drag and it has some lift to it. And by turning this vehicle, you turn the, the, the lift vector. Therefore, you can go to the right and you can go to the left. And the, the, uh, the computer program was designed to control the vehicle at this point and move the vehicle through the atmosphere in, uh, uh, in either a short way or a long way, depending upon how they came in and eventually deploy the parachutes. So the, uh, the, the drag is slowing down the vehicle through the, through the atmosphere as it comes down through the lift is used for steering and eventually uh, brings the vehicle down into the, uh, into the ocean. The AGC itself, the computer uh, controls the, the lift direction. The, the astronaut was trained to do this by hand. He never had to do it. He never wanted to do it. He had certain reticles that, was, that were on his window that he could use sort of to, to uh, direct the vehicle uh, coming down, but he never did do it. He just sat there uh, coming through this and let the computer do, do this. And they did, the computer did a wonderful job in, in, in this. There, there were of course no ground communications coming through the plasma uh, that, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, atmosphere like this. So it had to be a complete computer control. And of course it came through just like that and uh, wound up on an Apollo splashdown on July 24th, 1969 in the ocean uh, and was picked up by a, uh, a naval uh, vessel. By the way, the uh, Jules Verne vehicle came in and uh, sank for a while and then 
the uh, capsule popped up in the middle of the ocean and some Navy vessel picked it up and uh, brought it back to Cal California. I'd just like to give you people a feel of, about something else that was very significant in the program. Uh, in the Apollo 8 mission, which went behind, uh, if you recall, it was the Christmas time mission. Uh, it was the first time of any vehicle getting to the moon and they, they read from the Bible and all that. I'm pretty sure a lot of people remember that. But uh, we were at MIT at that time when the vehicle first uh, passed behind the moon. It did not have a lem. And this was the very first time and uh, behind the moon, the, uh, you can't see it from the ground. So they had no ground support and the vehicle had to be fired. The SPS engine had to be fired for the first time behind the moon under, under uh, computer control for the first time. And uh, he, when it passed behind the moon, you wouldn't hear from the vehicle for another 45 or 42 minutes. So uh, it went behind the moon and we all sat there in almost absolute silence with everybody on the, this computer, uh, this uh, audio net listening to this, including NASA, nobody saying anything, hoping that we're gonna hear from the astronauts in 42 minutes when they come behind, come from out behind the, the uh, end of the, uh, the side of the moon. And uh, everybody sat there looking at the clock. And sure enough, at about 42 or 43 minutes, NASA started calling them at Apollo 8 uh, uh, Houston, Apollo 8 Houston. And they finally popped up with their voice and they said everything worked beautifully. They were busy dealing with the computer and so on. But it was a uh, heart and mouth time because it was the very first time that everything came together. The, the, the computer, the uh, uh, platform, the, the engine, everything, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. It could have uh, driven itself into the uh, lunar surface. Anyway, it was, a, it was quite a time. When I was a young engineer, I worked up at Sanders and uh, in the R&D lab. Our, our section was asked to uh, make a, a power filter, you know, for the electrical uh, system in the uh, LEM. Well, that seemed to be a very simple job, you know, so we took it. Well, famous last words. It had to meet certain reliability criteria, and every time we built it, it wouldn't meet the reliability criteria. We had everybody down our necks, you know, from NASA to the contractors, everybody. Can you fix the problem for us? Well, I did. I looked at the filter, and uh, every drawing, one drawing in particular, struck me. It said, we got to make this. Uh, aluminum on mylar capacitor and any changes, please notify Sanders Associates, any changes to, to the manufacturing process of this capacitor. Well, the SOB didn't do it. He made changes, but didn't tell us. And uh, once we found that out, we finally got this little uh, capacitor made you know, put it in its aluminum box, ship that out, did the reliability testing and everything worked fine. And then afterwards, you know, I think one of the LEMS actually saved, there was an explosion and it had to come back early and the LEMS saved the lives of the astronauts on the way back. Yeah, that was Apollo 13, which by the way, if anybody is, uh, I'm sure all of you have seen Apollo 13, but if you uh, have an opportunity to take a look, another look at it, you'll see uh, uh, and, and pay a little close attention to the astronauts uh, uh, grappling with the computer and how they dealt with it. I think you'll find it somewhat interesting. It's an excellent series. Many of you probably heard it called 13 Minutes at the Moon, BBC, um, just phenomenal. And one of the things I never heard about was on, they did one season on Apollo 13, one on uh, basically the landing program. Fabulous history of mission control, of the relationship with MIT, the development of the, the software, really great. But on the 13, the Apollo 13, they actually had to turn off the guidance system on the way back from the moon to save energy. And I never understood this. And the risk of powering it back up and then recalibrating it. And when Fred explained the, um, the gyros and how you had to sight on the, the stars to re-establish that, um, that known location, it really cleared up a lot of things. So thank you, Fred. That was awesome. But the this the this the the treatment in Apollo Apollo 13 on the BBC was fan, was really very well done. 
By the way, there's another series I could recommend called Moon Machines. It was done by a British company a number of years ago. It's an excellent series and covers all of the aspects of the program, including uh, it's about six separate uh, series of about 40 or 45 minutes each that covers uh, space, uh, the, the, the boosters, the navigation system, the, the, uh, the uh, astronaut uh, 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 clothing, uh, the power system, almost everything. It's called Moon Machines. I don't see anything here from the chat. Uh, I, I see a question about the role of Margaret Hamilton. Go ahead. Uh, Margaret worked in, our, in the group. Uh, initially, uh, she uh, uh, was working for me for a while and then it had other aspects. She eventually became uh, the uh, supervisor of uh, programs, uh, of the spacecraft programs. Uh, in the Apollo uh, mission. She did an, uh, a, an excellent job along, al along the way. She was eventually uh, recognized by pr um, President Obama and received a, a, a Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom for uh, her work uh, in the Apollo uh, program. Uh, really a very uh, valuable colleague. I'd like to make an observation about uh, error messages. Uh, back uh, on ground, when I was writing Fortran programs, it was very common to uh, have a Fortran error. And all I would get back, if I can remember this correctly, is IEF217I. I may have a letter or a number wrong in that. But um, the IBM compiler, which must have known what my error was, uh, chose not to tell me and merely gave me the number. And when I checked out the number in the book, it gave me a very generic answer. Now, I was on ground where there was no time criticality. What perplexes me is that if error messages were written into your computer systems, which obviously they were, shouldn't there be some standard listing book maybe not an online entry, but something that would tell everybody what each error message means? I, the answer to that is yes, uh, uh, but uh, these, these error messages uh, were uh, sort of deep into the system programming of the uh, Apollo guidance computer. And a lot of people on the spot uh, during that time were unfamiliar with them. Uh, there, there was one uh, individual down at NASA, Jack Garman. Unfortunately, he passed away a little while ago, a few years ago. And he took the uh, initiative of writing down all the error messages and their code and what they stood for and pasted it up near his workstation. And he was the one who looked and understood what this error message, uh, uh, what it was about and why he could, could uh, uh, go forward. This, of course, was not a it was not a computer programming error. It was more of a of an observation of a hardware problem than uh, than anything else. But anyway, I, I, I take your point. There, there was a list of error messages not very apparent to most people. I remember something that I read somewhere. Because the, the 1201 and 1206, I think it was maybe in Apollo 13, they made a point of, or some other documentation about that. The, the error codes did, were in fact encoded in a way. The 12 part said it was a certain subsystem so that at least people understood what was going on. Though the second part of the message was the part that was confusing. One, uh, one interesting thing on that day when I went around running around trying to find out what was going on, uh, uh, which I've written up in a paper, uh, a sort of a retrospective kind of memoir paper, uh, was that I, I finally got down to somebody at Grumman and I said to him, gee, you do, you have all this training with an astronaut and uh, they, they, they turn on switches and so on. Have you ever seen a computer that was running slowly and gave you a problem? And the guy says to me, well, we only have a procedural uh, mock-up uh, when he he's supposed to flip the switch but the switch isn't connected to, to anything it's just to, to make him throw the switch not to make not to have the switch do anything um, so I had two questions one is regarding the disk key 
can you share uh, if there were any interesting incidents where the astronauts actually made an error with it? And you know what sorts of, of uh, strategies you took to uh, minimize errors? Because it's a fascinating interface and I'd love to get some insight for that. So that's, that's one a, question. That's a very and, good, good question, very interesting question. Uh, I was not involved in the design of the DISCI. So when I, when I discovered it I, I, and, and thought about it some, I thought that the verb, the verb noun idea was really uh, uh, an unusual idea, almost, um, almost connecting to the subject of linguistics. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the DISCI, um, let me just say, I, I lost my train of thought for a moment. Uh, Any in, in, in running the compiler, in running the computer, we, one activity I can mention is that uh, we had some high school kids come in on Saturdays uh, to fool around with the DISCI, uh, uh, to see uh, uh, sort of using it as almost like a, uh, a monkey toy to press in this and this and that and see what would happen and see what errors would they could they could uh, uh, involve themselves in. But there was a philosophical point that we came to in dealing with the astronaut that was uh, uh, somewhat serious. And that is, uh, could we program in the computer a, uh, something that is pretty evident and very, uh, very present in today's computers? Could we program a system that would intercept an error and give him a, uh, an indication that, that he has done something wrong in the DISCI? And uh, this turned out to be a, uh, a somewhat futile exercise because while, while you can do a finite number of things correctly, and you need to do a finite number of things correctly, you can probably do an infinite number of things incorrectly. And it became to the point where we made the decision that if he's gonna kill himself, he could kill himself with a pencil and we couldn't stop him. And uh, we just gave up. We did not have the capacity in, our, in that little computer to deal with the astronaut, the possibility of error. So at any rate, we gave up on that. And uh, I was sitting in the uh, MIT room. We, we, we were on 24 hours a day in any flight in shifts of, I forgot, maybe five hours or something. And this was a Sunday afternoon, Christmas. It was the Apollo 8 flight, Sunday afternoon, beautiful day. Uh, sunshiny and so on, and uh, uh, sitting there, and uh, uh, he's on his way home, very uneventful flight, exciting flight, reading from the Bible and all that kind of stuff, and uh, I think uh, uh, one of the astronauts, I'll, I'll think of his name in a, in a moment, uh, is on, is on, and uh, we have a, we have a, 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 a live uh, audio net that goes around to contractors and NASA so that everybody who's on is on earphones. And we had three people on, I was one of the people on at MIT at that, at that particular time of day. And I hear the astronauts say, uh, uh oh, uh, NASA handles whatever the astronauts say by one person, one person in Houston, and usually a very calm and collected voice. And uh, he just says, uh, uh, what do you mean, uh-oh? Uh and the guy says, I think I did something wrong on the computer. So he said, he said to him, well, well, what do you think uh, that you did? And he says, well, I, I was trying to do navigation with star sightings and I pressed a, a program of a pool, which was P for program, which is, isn't, you had, to, you had to do verb 37, but it was called program P00 which was poo. And that is a program that is only, only used at Cape Kennedy when it's on the pad for checkout purposes. And so he used it in flight while he was in the middle of his navigation. And he said, I think I did something wrong. Two minutes later, we get a telephone call from NASA. He said, what did he do? What, what was the effect of this? He, he said, we, we said, well, nobody has ever done that before. Nobody has ever selected that program in the middle of the navigation program. So we'll have to get back to you. We want to understand what he did. 
So we got out this, uh, our listing, which was, uh, I don't know if you can see me, but it's about that big uh, listing of uh, right off a, a, a regular uh, a printer that the old, old fashioned printer. And we had our people, a couple of people going through the page after page, tracing what would happen if you had loaded up the data with star sightings and navigational data, and then all of a sudden you selected two. And it turned out after uh, two or three hours of dealing to get to the bottom of this thing, he actually wiped out all his navigation data. Okay, just completely overwritten it. We did not have that much volatile con uh, memory and he had wiped it all out. And so we reported that to NASA and, uh, and they of course were very upset at that. Uh, uh, they did have about four different ways to communicate to the, uh, to the astronaut by radios of various kinds. And uh, they told us that, uh, look, we wanna, we wanna get that, uh, uh, understand that and we wanna get that fixed because uh, if we lose communication, he won't have the ability to navigate because he lost all his navigation data. So we said, what do you mean lose communications? So he said, well, you, we don't know. We might lose communications. It's just a possibility. But they had three, three or four systems. Anyway, in the end, they understood what the problem was and they telemated up, up, tele, up, uplink, uplink to him all his navigation data that he needed. And so he had now his computer full of navigation data again. So in case they lose the communication, he could navigate. So that's a sort of a couple of stories about the, about the disking, but it was a successful device, even though it was a bit strange. You had another question, Ken, or were you good? Yes. Uh, yeah, just uh, one more quick question. I know that the astronauts carried at least one slide rule on board and I wanted to know whether it was a backup device and whether they ever had to use it. I do not know the answer to that uh, question. Uh, mo when, I, when I was in that program, most of those guys were pretty smart. Uh, they were more than fighter pilots, let's say. Uh, some of them had gone through PhDs at MIT and, and, and what have you. Whether they used the slide rule or not, I would imagine so, unless they, I'd have to look up the year unless they carried some kind of HP calculator. I don't know if such a thing existed at, at, at that time. So I, I really can't answer that question. All right. Well, I know I have my slide rule. Here we go. Which I, which I have in this case, right over here. It's a post slide rule in case I need it.